Look, there's Mother Goose walking with her little ducks. As the ducks cross the street, they go quack, quack, quack. It's another day in Mother Goose world. The ducklings are walking to their favorite playroom to hear stories and have a good time. Didn't you know? Ducklings love a fun rhyme. Gather around, ducklings, gather around. It's story time. Are you ready to have fun? Story time? Oh, I can't wait, Mother Goose. And I want to let loose. <laughs> you all are so cute and so clever. Here comes the first story, little ones. Let's all listen together. In a far city in China, there once lived a lad named Aladdin. Aladdin's mother was a widow, and the boy had never had a father's care. He did as he pleased, and played in the streets all day, and was so idle that he was of no use to anyone. One day, as Aladdin was playing with a band of companions, a tall man, richly dressed, stopped to watch them. Suddenly, he called to Aladdin, Come here, boy. I wish to speak to you. The lad came, wondering. Are you not the son of Mustafa the tailor? Asked the stranger. Aladdin said that he was. I knew it, cried the stranger. I knew it from your likeness to your dear father. He then embraced the boy tenderly. I, dear lad, am your uncle, said he. I have spent many years in strange countries and have made a fortune. I came back here in search of you, for I had heard your father was dead, and I wished to take his place and be a father to you. Aladdin was very much surprised. He had never known he had an uncle, and indeed he had not. The stranger was a magician who had need of a stout and active lad to help in a certain adventure. He had noticed Aladdin playing in the streets and had found out the lad's name and the name of his father so as to pass himself off as Aladdin's uncle. Aladdin was eager to believe the story the stranger told, for he thought it would be a fine thing to have a rich uncle to help him along in the world. Lead me to your mother's house, Aladdin, said the magician. I wish to talk with her and to weep with her over the memory of my dear brother. Aladdin took the stranger's hand and led him away through one street after another, each meaner and dirtier than the other. At last, he stopped before a miserable-looking hovel. This is where I live, said the boy. Here, cried the magician. Oh, what a miserable place for my brother's child to live. But I will soon change all this. You must move into a handsome house, and you must have some better clothes than those you have on. I will make your fortune for you. Aladdin was more delighted than ever when he heard this. He made haste to open the door and lead the magician to his mother and to repeat to her the story he had been told. The widow was even more surprised than her son over the magician's story, but she was quite as eager to believe it as he. It would indeed be a fine thing if the stranger would lift them out of their poverty. She begged him to sit down and share their evening meal, but this he would not do. He said he had business with some merchants and went away after promising to come back the next day. On the morrow, as he had promised, the magician returned, and he took Aladdin out with him, and bought him fine clothes and sweetmeats to eat, and he talked so much of all he meant to do for his dear nephew that the boy's head was quite turned. The following morning he came again, and asked Aladdin whether he would not like to take a walk in the country, as it was such a fine day. Aladdin gladly agreed to this plan. It was pleasant to be with his new uncle and to hear him talk of all the grand things he intended to do. The magician led the boy out of the city, talking pleasantly all the while, 
and on and on into the country, so far that at last the lad began to grow weary and to wonder when they would turn back. In time, they came to a lonely valley, shut in by high hills, and here the stranger stopped. My dear nephew, I wish to show you something here that is very curious, said the false uncle, but first gather together a few dry sticks and build a little fire. This Aladdin did. When the fire was burning brightly, the magician drew from under his robe a small box. He opened it and, taking from it a pinch of powder, he threw it into the fire and at the same time saying some magic words. Immediately there was a loud noise like a clap of thunder and the ground opened before them, showing a great stone in which was a brass ring. Aladdin was so frightened by these happenings that he would have run away, but the stranger caught him roughly by the arm. Stay where you are, he cried. I have brought you here to do a special thing for me, and if you refuse, you shall not escape alive. If, however, you are obedient, I will make you rich for life. What do you wish of me? asked Aladdin in a trembling voice. First, lift this stone for me. Aladdin caught hold of the brass ring and tried to lift the stone, but it was too heavy for him, and the magician was obliged to help him. Together they dragged away the stone and showed an opening and a flight of stairs leading down into the earth. Now, said the pretended uncle, you must go down these steps and they will bring you to a palace divided into three halls. You will see in these halls great chests filled with gold and silver, but for your life do not touch them. Do not even brush against the walls or touch them either, for if you do, you will surely perish. Go straight through the halls and you will come to a garden. It is full of fruit trees, and if you should wish to gather some of the fruit, you may safely do so. No harm will come to you from doing so. At the farthest side of the garden is a wall. In this wall is a niche. In this niche is a small bronze lamp. Take it and empty out the oil and bring it to me. Aladdin had no wish to descend the stairs into the earth, but the stranger frightened him and he dared not refuse. He started down, but the magician called him back. Here, take this, he said, and slipping a ring from his finger, he placed it on Aladdin's hand. It will protect you from any dangers you may meet with. Aladdin now went on down the stairs, and at the foot of them he found the palace halls the stranger had told him of. Everywhere he saw chests of silver and gold, but he was careful to touch none of them. He walked on very warily and out into the garden. He found the lamp without any trouble, emptied out the oil, and thrust it into the sash that was twisted about his waist. All about him were fruit trees loaded with the most beautiful fruits he had ever seen. They were of all colours and shone as though polished. Aladdin picked some of them, but instead of being juicy and delicious as he had expected, they were so hard he could neither bite nor break them. They seemed indeed to be made of glass, only much harder and brighter. They were so pretty, the boy gathered a great quantity of them. He filled his pockets and sleeves and shirt with the fruit and then hurried back through the hall and up the steps. He saw his pretended uncle stooping over and watching for him impatiently. Did you get the lamp? cried the magician eagerly. Yes, I have it here. The magician's eyes sparkled with triumph. He reached down his hand. Give it to me, quick, quick, he cried. In a moment, said Aladdin, but my hands are full of fruit and it is in my waistband. First help me out and then I will give it to you. No, no, give it to me now, cried the magician sharply. He did not, indeed, intend to let Aladdin ever come out alive. He meant as soon as he had the lap to push the stone back into place and fasten the lad in. Aladdin did not guess this, but for some reason he suddenly felt afraid. I cannot give you the lamp, he cried, until you let me out. Give it to me, I tell you, 
Not until you let me out. Suddenly, the magician flew into a black rage. Then stay where you are, he cried fiercely. He threw another pinch of powder into the fire which was still burning and muttered a magic charm. At once, the stone rose and dropped back into its place and Aladdin found himself shut in, in darkness. Filled with terror, he beat upon the stone and called to the magician to let him out. But there was no answer. He put his shoulders under the stone and tried to lift it, but it would not stir. Aladdin sat down and wept bitter tears. He felt he was a prisoner forever. Suddenly, he remembered the garden. Perhaps he could find some way out through it. He made his way slowly down the steps, feeling his way through the darkness. And as he did this, he happened to rub the magician's ring against the wall. At once, a horrible genie appeared before him, as black as pitch, but with eyes that shone like a red fire and lightened up the darkness. What wouldst thou have? asked this terrible being. I and the other slaves of the ring upon thy finger stand ready to serve thee. Aladdin was astonished beyond measure, but he made shift to say, If you are able, take me away from here and back to my mother's house. To hear is to obey, answered the genie. At once, Aladdin felt himself caught up and carried through the air, swifter than the wind, and almost before he could draw breath, he was back in his mother's house and the genie had disappeared. His mother could hardly believe her eyes when Aladdin appeared so suddenly before her. My dear son, where did you come from and where is your uncle? She asked. As soon as Aladdin could get his breath, he told her the whole story. His mother listened and wondered. Without doubt, said she, this man is not your uncle at all, but a magician who wished to use you for some wicked purpose. To this Aladdin agreed, but he was so hungry that he begged his mother to get him something to eat before they talked further. His mother began to weep. Alas, said she, I have not a morsel of food in the house and no money with which to buy any. Aladdin remembered the lamp which was still in his waistband. He drew it out. Look, said he, this lamp must be worth something since the magician was so anxious to have it. Take it to some shop or to one of the neighbours and perhaps they will pay you enough for it for us to buy some rice. This seemed to the mother a wise plan. I will do as you say, said she, but first I will brighten the lamp for it is very black and dirty. She took some sand and water to polish it, but scarcely had she begun to rub it when a genie, even more terrible looking than the genie of the ring, appeared before them. What dost thou wish? he asked in a voice of thunder. I and the other slaves of the lamp stand ready to serve thee in all things. The widow was so terrified at the sight of the genie and at the sound of his voice that she fell down on her face and lay there. But Aladdin caught the lamp from her hand. If you would serve me, bring us something to eat, he cried. To hear is to obey answered the genie. At once he disappeared, but scarcely was he gone before he appeared again with a great silver tray and a number of silver dishes and cups, full of all sorts of delicious things to eat and drink. The genie set it upon a table. Hast thou any further commands? he asked in a voice of thunder. Not at present, answered Aladdin. At once the genie disappeared. Aladdin called to his mother, and when she looked up and saw the genie had gone, she was able to raise herself from the floor, though she still shook and trembled. She and her son sat down, and ate and drank to their heart's content, and there was enough food left over to serve them another day. Aladdin then took the silver tray and the dishes out to a merchant he knew, and sold them for a good price. So in this way, he had money to spend. After this, Aladdin and his mother lived very comfortably. Whenever they were hungry, Aladdin had only to rub the lamp and command the genie to bring them food, and it was served to them immediately. 
Aladdin now began to go about among the merchants of the city and talk with them. And before long, he learned to his surprise that the fruits he had brought with him from the garden were not glass at all, but jewels. And jewels so rare and magnificent that they were not to be equaled anywhere. Now, the sultan of that country had one daughter, the princess Budir al Badur, and she was the most beautiful princess in the world. No man was ever allowed to see her face. When she rode through the city to the public baths, the sultan commanded that all the houses should be closed and that the people should stay indoors and not look out upon pain of death. Now, Aladdin was very curious as well as bold. One day, when the princess was to pass through the city, he hid himself near the door of the baths without anyone knowing it. The princess came riding down the street with all her guards and ladies in waiting about her. And just as she reached the door, near which Aladdin was hiding, she dropped her veil and he saw her face. At once, he was filled with a violent love for her. It seemed to him he could not live unless he could have the princess for a wife. When he returned home, his mother noticed that he was very thoughtful. She did not know what had happened to him. At last, she asked, My son, what ails you? Why are you so thoughtful and silent? My mother, answered Aladdin, I have seen the princess Budir al Badur, and unless I can marry her, I no longer wish to live. When the widow heard these words, she thought her son must be crazy. How can you think of such a thing? she cried. Have you forgotten that your father was nothing but a tailor? How can a tailor's son hope to marry a princess? Nevertheless, that is what I intend to do, said Aladdin. He then urged and entreated his mother to go to the palace and ask the Sultan to give the princess to him. The widow was very loath to do this, but she loved her son so tenderly that at last she consented. But have you forgotten, said she, that no one can come before the Sultan without bringing him a present? I have not forgotten, said Aladdin. And I mean to send the Sultan such a gift as he has never seen before. He then fetched from the cupboard a porcelain dish, and he also brought out the fruits he had brought from the garden. He arranged the fruits in the dish in a pyramid according to their colors, and when he had done this, his mother was amazed at their beauty. They shone so brightly that it dazzled the eyes to look at them. Now, I will tell you, said Aladdin, that these fruits are jewels so rare and magnificent that not the greatest ruler on earth has any that can equal them. The widow was amazed when she heard this. She could hardly believe it, and it was with fear and trembling that she set out at length for the Sultan's palace. She carried the dish of jewels with her, covered over with a fine napkin. When she reached the palace, she went into the audience chamber with the rest of the crowd who had come to bring their cases before the Sultan. She sat down near the wall and stayed there all day, but she found no chance to speak to the Sultan or to offer her gift. And so it was day after day. Every morning she came to the audience chamber with the jewels, and every evening she returned home without having spoken to him. But it so chanced the Sultan noticed how she came day after day with the covered dish in her hands, and he grew curious as to who she was and what she wanted. At last he spoke to his Grand Vizier about her and commanded that she should be brought before him. This was done, but the poor woman was so frightened by the honour done that she stood there trembling and unable to say a word. The Sultan saw her terror and spoke to her gently. My good woman, said he, do not be afraid. Tell me why you have come here day after day. Is there something you wish to ask of me? There is indeed something that I wish to ask, and yet I dare not, said the widow. The Sultan, however, encouraged her. Speak, said he, do not be afraid. Tell me what you wish. My son, said the widow, wishes to marry the Princess Budir al Badur, and I have come here to ask you to give her to him as a wife, and my son also sends this small present, which he begs you to accept. 
when this widow, so poor and meanly dressed, said that her son wished to marry the princess, the sultan could hardly keep from laughing. But when she uncovered the dish of jewels, he was amazed. He took one up after another and examined it with admiration. He turned to the vizier, who stood beside him. Never in all my life before, said he, have I seen such beautiful jewels. Truly, a man who can send me such a gift as this is worthy to have a princess for a wife. Do you not agree with me? When the Grand Vizier heard this, he was troubled. He had indeed hoped that his own son might marry the princess. Now he said, Your Majesty, these jewels are indeed very wonderful, but we know nothing of the man who sent them. He may be only some beggarly rogue who has stolen them. That is true, said the Sultan. He thought for a moment, still turning the jewels with his fingers. Then he said to the woman, I am indeed very much pleased with the gift your son has sent me. Go back and tell him I am inclined to give him the princess for a wife, but first he must send me forty basins of massy gold filled with the same sort of jewels as these. If he can do this, I will gladly have him for a son-in-law. The widow returned home and told her son what the sultan had said. Aladdin was overjoyed when he heard the message. He now felt sure that before long he would be married to the princess. He took the lamp and rubbed it, and at once the genie appeared. What dost thou wish? asked the genie. I and the other slaves of the lamp are ready to serve thee in all things. I wish, said Aladdin, for forty basins of massy gold filled with jewels such as I gathered in the garden. I also wish for forty black slaves, magnificently dressed, to carry the basins, and forty white slaves, also magnificently dressed and mounted on fine horses, to ride before them and behind. To hear is to obey, answered the genie. At once he disappeared, but almost in a moment of time a long procession of slaves appeared in the street where Aladdin lived and gathered before his house. There were forty black slaves, magnificently dressed, and each bearing on his head a golden basin, filled with jewels even more magnificent than those Aladdin had gathered for himself. And there were also forty white slaves, mounted on horses, to ride before them and behind. When Aladdin saw these slaves and the jewels they bore, his eyes sparkled with joy. He at once commanded them to march to the palace and present the jewels to the sultan, and the widow herself hastened away so as to reach the palace at the same time that they did. The slaves set out through the city. A great crowd followed them, shouting and rejoicing, for never had such a sight been seen there before. The sultan heard the sound of huzzahing and wondered what was the reason for it. But when the slaves entered the palace, bearing their basins of jewels, he himself was filled with wonder and admiration. He turned to his vizier. Surely, said he, anyone who can send me such a gift as this is worthy of the princess Budir al-Badur. And though the vizier could hardly hide his envy, he was obliged to agree with his master. When Aladdin heard that the Sultan had consented to his marriage with the princess, he could hardly contain his joy. He at once rubbed the lamp, and when the genie appeared, he commanded him to bring him the most magnificent clothes, such as were suitable for a Sultan's son to wear, and also a handsome horse for him to ride upon, and a troop of horsemen, handsomely dressed, to ride with him. All this the genie did. And after Aladdin had bathed in a scented bath and had dressed himself in his magnificent garments, he was so handsome and noble-looking that his old friends would not have known him. He rode away to the palace, and there the Sultan received him with the greatest respect and honour. He would have married Aladdin to his daughter at once, but this Aladdin did not wish. Your Majesty, said he, Greatly as I long to see the Princess Budir al-Badur, I wish first to provide a palace for us to live in when we are married. For this purpose I beg of your majesty to give me a plot of ground where I can build it. 
The Sultan was surprised and disappointed when he heard this. He thought it would take years to build a palace, and he could not understand how Aladdin could want to wait that long before marrying the princess. However, he gave him the ground he asked for. Aladdin then returned home and rubbed the lamp. At once, the genie appeared before him and asked him what were his commands. I command you, said Aladdin, to build me immediately a castle twice as handsome as that of the Sultan. I wish it to be furnished throughout in the most magnificent manner, and I also wish for a proper number of servants and guards to take charge of it. There must also be gardens around it, with fountains and trees and flowers and stables full of handsome horses, and above all, there must be a treasure house filled with gold and silver and precious stones. To hear is to obey, answered the genie, and at once he disappeared. The next morning, when the sultan awoke and looked from the window, he could hardly believe his eyes. He stared and rubbed his eyes and looked again. There, upon the bare piece of ground he had given to Aladdin, stood a great palace, glittering with gold and silver and precious stones. It was far more magnificent than his own, and it had been built in one single night. The Sultan at once sent for Aladdin, and when he came the Sultan made the tailor's son sit beside him and talked with him as an equal. My dear Aladdin, said he, you are indeed a very wonderful man, and it is only fitting that the most beautiful princess in the world should be your wife, and you shall be as dear to me as though you were my own son. That very day, Aladdin and the princess were married and went to live in the magic palace, and as they loved each other dearly, nothing could equal their happiness. Aladdin felt so secure in his good fortune that he never even thought of the magician or wondered whether he might someday come to claim the lamp. The magician had indeed left China soon after his adventure with Aladdin. He journeyed back and forth over the earth in many places, and at last in his wanderings he came again to the city where he had met Aladdin. There he heard much talk of how a poor lad had married the daughter of the Sultan and of the magnificent palace he had built. The magician never thought that Aladdin might be that poor lad, for he supposed he had perished in the hidden garden. At last, the magician became curious to see the palace that everyone was talking about, and he hired a horse and rode out to where it stood. As soon as he saw it, he knew at once that it had been built by the genie of the lamp. He hastened home and got out his magic books, and from them learned that Aladdin was still alive, and that it was he who owned the palace and had become the Sultan's son-in-law. When the magician learned this, he was filled with rage, and at once began to plot and plan as to how he could get the lamp for himself and destroy Aladdin. In order to carry out this purpose, he bought a number of fine new lamps and disguised himself in poor, mean clothing. He waited until one time when Aladdin had gone hunting with the Sultan, and then he started out through the city with his tray of lamps, calling, New lamps for old, new lamps for old. Many people heard his cry and came hurrying out of their houses with old broken lamps and offered them to the magician to exchange. He took them willingly. For all of these old lamps he gave in return, Find new ones. The people thought he must be crazy. A great crowd followed him, shouting and laughing. At last, the magician arrived in front of Aladdin's castle. The princess was sitting in an upper room with her attendants and yawning and feeling quite dull because Aladdin was away. When she heard the noise and hubbub in the street, she became curious. She sent one of her women to find out what the noise was about. She hoped it might be something amusing. Presently, the woman came back, laughing. Fancy, cried she, it is an old man with a tray of the most beautiful new lamps, and he is trading them for old ones. The princess was much amused at this idea. Where is that old blackened lamp that I have seen your master have? Asked she. Look about and see if you can find it. Her woman began to search the palace, and at last they found the magic lamp hidden away in a corner of the treasure room. They brought it to the princess, and she at once caused the magician to be brought before her. 
Here, old man, said she, laughing. Here is an old lamp. Will you give me a new one for it? When the magician saw the lamp, he could hardly hide his joy. Gladly, madam, he answered. Choose whichever of the lamps you will, and it shall be yours. The princess chose one that pleased her well, and the magician took the old lamp and hurried away with it. No sooner had he reached home than he shut himself up alone in his room and rubbed the lamp. At once, the genie appeared. What do you wish? he cried. I and the other slaves of the lamp stand ready to serve you. I wish, cried the magician in a terrible voice, that the palace of Aladdin and all that are in it shall be carried away to Africa. To hear is to obey, answered the genie and immediately disappeared. That evening, the Sultan and Aladdin came home from their hunt. They rode along together, talking pleasantly, until they came within sight of the Sultan's palace. Suddenly, the Sultan drew rein and stared with blank surprise. The castle that Aladdin had built in a single night was gone. Not a sign of it was left. Your palace, cried the Sultan. Where is your palace? Aladdin too stared thunderstruck. I, I do not know, he faltered. You do not know, cried the Sultan. And my daughter, where is she? I do not know, answered Aladdin again. The Sultan was filled with rage. You do not know, he thundered. Miserable wretch, was your castle only the work of enchantment? Have you carried off my daughter by your magic? Now unless you bring her back at once, you shall surely die. Aladdin was in despair. He begged the Sultan to allow him forty days in which to search for the princess, and to this the Sultan at last consented. Aladdin at once set out on the search, but he did not know in which direction to go. He wandered about from one place to another without learning anything about the fate of the princess or his palace. At last one day he found himself in a rocky spot by the sea. In descending the rocks, he slipped and caught his hand on a sharp point, and in doing so, he rubbed the magician's ring, which he still wore, but which he had forgotten. At once, the genie of the ring appeared before him. Master, said he, what wouldst thou have? I and the other slaves of the ring stand ready to serve thee. Aladdin was overjoyed to find that the ring still kept its magic powers. I wish, said he, that you would bring back my palace and the princess, or else take me where they are. I cannot bring them back, answered the slave of the ring, for they have been carried away by the genie of the lamp, who is mightier than I, but I can take you where they are. The slave of the ring then caught up Aladdin, and in less time than it takes to tell, he had carried him to Africa and had set him down in the apartment of the palace where the princess was. When the princess saw Aladdin thus suddenly appear before her, she gave a cry of joy and threw herself into his arms. The lamp, cried Aladdin, where is the lamp? For he wished to protect himself against the power of the magician. Alas, cried the princess, I do not know where it is. Already I fear that all our misfortunes had come from my trading off that lamp to a beggar. She then told Aladdin the whole story of how one had come offering new lamps for old and of how her women had hunted up the old blackened lamp, and she had given it away for a new one. Aladdin at once guessed that the beggar must have been the magician in disguise. We will never be safe, said he, until we have that lamp in our possession again. Does the magician ever come here? Oh yes, said the princess. He comes here every day and wearies me with his pretty speeches. He wishes to marry me, but that I will never do. Now listen, said Aladdin, the next time the magician comes, greet him pleasantly, talk to him for a while, and then offer him a glass of sherbet. In this sherbet you must first put a powder that I will give you. It is a sleeping powder. After the magician drinks it, he will fall into a deep sleep. You must then at once call me. Together we will search his clothing, for I feel sure he is afraid to leave the lamp anywhere and carries it always about him. If we can once get hold of the lamp, all of our troubles are at an end. The princess promised to do exactly as Aladdin bade her, and then he gave her the powder and hid himself in a room nearby. 
Not long after this, the magician came, as usual, to sit and talk with the princess. She met him with smiling looks, and was so pleasant and friendly that the magician was delighted. He hoped the princess was beginning to love him, and that before long, she would consent to be his wife. Presently, the princess took up a glass of sherbet, in which she had already dissolved the powder. I thought you might be thirsty, said she, and I prepared this sherbet for you. Will you not drink it? The magician thanked her, and taking the goblet, he drank the sherbet at one draught. Almost at once, his head dropped back on the cushions, and he sank in a deep sleep. The princess did not delay a moment in calling Aladdin. He came in haste, and together they searched the garments of the magician. It did not take them long to find the lamp, which was hidden in his vest. Aladdin rubbed it, and the genie of the lamp appeared before him. What dost thou wish? he cried. I and all the other slaves of the lamp stand ready to obey thee. First, said Aladdin, I wish this magician carried away to the uttermost parts of the earth, and I wish him never to be allowed to come within a hundred miles of the lamp again. Secondly, I wish my palace to be returned to the place from which it was taken. To hear is to obey, answered the genie. He disappeared with the magician, and as the magician never was seen again, he probably never escaped from the ends of the earth. As for the palace, it and all that was in it were returned to the place where it first stood, and the sultan was so delighted to see his daughter again that he gladly forgave Aladdin. The tailor's son was raised to the greatest honours in the kingdom, and upon the sultan's death, he became sultan, and lived happy forever after with his beautiful wife, Budir al Badur. Wasn't it fun, little ducklings? Now it's time to go home. All right, let's get in a row. Can I lead, please? <laughs> You're too little yet, my sweet baby. Maybe next time. Now, get behind Mother Goose and form a little duck line. As Mother Goose and her ducklings head home for the night, the sun begins to set in Mother Goose world. Oh, what a sight! <laughs> <laughs>